Um, Barry Lamb is an associate professor of philosophy at Vassar College and host and executive producer of Slate's Hi Fi Nation podcast. Barry received his PhD from Princeton in 2007 and has taught at Vassar since 2006. Hi Fi Nation is going on its fourth season and it will be entirely focused on the philosophy of criminal justice. So tune in for that. Now I'd like to welcome Antonio. <coughs> Okay, so I brought some business cards. Um, some of you are podcast savvy, some of you are podcast. It's radio on your device. Uh, and if you want to listen to the show, I have some cards out here. If you want to find some, it tells you exactly how to do it. And you can contact me, there's a email address on it. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful to the Writing Foundation uh, for funding the entire fourth season of the podcast. Um, because I wanted to do an entire series on philosophical issues in the underlying the criminal justice system in America since I started the show, and I needed to spend a whole season doing it. So I'm currently doing all the research and reporting for that. And in the new year, January, February, will be at least six episodes, maybe even one episode on this. But in the last season, I spent two episodes, the first two episodes of season three, um, which are up there, the pre-cutting unit and this to business. Uh, those were both um, episodes uh, about criminal justice, the issues that I'm going to be talking to tonight. So if you want kind of the hour and a half version, um, go ahead and listen to those two episodes. So there's a little puzzle uh, about statistics and the law that they teach first year law students. And recently, a lot of philosophers have become interested in that puzzle. And here's how it goes. Um, there, Suppose at dusk you see a bus accidentally clip your parked car, and then it drives away. And because of the lighting, um, you can't tell the color of the bus. Uh, but there are only two colors of buses in, in, this, in the city. There's blue buses and green buses, owned by a blue bus company or the green bus company. And it turns out that 75% of the buses in the city are blue buses from the blue bus company, and 25% of the buses are from the green bus company. And so you sue for damages. Let's say it's a million dollars. You sue for a million dollars in damages. Like not just for your car, but like for your kids or something like that. Um, are you going to win, right, on the basis of just that alone? You can tell what the color of the bus is. And it turns out, no, you are. On the basis of statistical evidence alone, 75%, um, even though that's 75% likely, you're not going to win that lawsuit. And that's actually a puzzle, because for civil cases, you just need to prove by the preponderance of evidence that it was, say, the blue bus companies that did it. And all the lawyers I talk to tell me that preponderance of evidence is vastly greater than 50%. But that's what it means. But if you think about it, it is greater than 50% that the blue bus, a blue bus kitchen, right? It's 75% likely. But still, that's so the wrong kind of evidence is what they teach lots of students. They don't characterize what it means to be the wrong kind of evidence. They just say that's the wrong kind. But if you compare it to the right kind of evidence, if, if there were 100 witnesses in the city, right, and um, each one of them testifies the color of the bus, and 75 said that it was blue, and 25 said it's green, that would be decisive, right? It would be like, yeah, right, 75 percent chance that it's uh, right. But that would count as the right kind of evidence. But the fact that it was 75 percent of the buses being blue is the wrong kind of evidence. So this is the puzzle that, they, that people try to figure out in, in the law of evidence and philosophy. Um, and so I wanted to pair it with like sort of a second puzzle that I want you to think about, which is this. Same kind of case, but I want you to imagine there's two different models of buses, right? A and B. And, um, and it turns out that 75% of the bus accidents involve this model A, and a quarter of them involve model B. Right? And there's um, the city's like, okay, we've got to like lower the accident rate. And so we're gonna we're gonna allocate a million dollars to fix the bricks on a model. And it's like it's easier to understand it's one model, it's easier to like design one intervention to fix all the bricks on one model and basically like 
to two different things. So I want you to just imagine something like this. You know, um, you can give it all to model to to uh, to fix model A, and it'll cut the accident rate in half. You can give it all to model B, and it'll cut that accident rate in half. Or you can like split it in some way, like three quarters. But then like if you spend it that way, you got to figure out. Like, let's do a study of like which ones of model A are likelier, and which ones should we apply, and then that's going to create. It's going to spend. You're going to have to spend a lot more of your money to do it, and uh, and you're not going to reduce the rate by half of either, right? So like, what would be the best thing to do in this kind of case? Right? And I think a lot of people, if you're out there, you think of, for a second about it, like you know, give it all to A, right? Because if you cut that rate in half, it's seventy-five percent of the accidents are coming from there, you know. Like that's the most effective use of money. That seems to be okay. Right. So why am I talking about this? Um, why am I talking about statistical evidence um, and the problems with statistical evidence? What that justifies and so on. Well, it turns out that that's the central philosophical problem underlying the use of AI and algorithmic decision making in the criminal justice system. Right? Um, so what am I talking about there? Well, I'm talking about the push currently to outsource judgments or decision making in the criminal justice system to machines and algorithms rather than human beings. Um, why is there such a push? I just take my word for it that there is such a push. Why is there such a push? Well, for the very reason that we think that um, uh, human decision making is part of the problem of the current system. Right? So think about everything from policing to judges sentencing. Right, so all and all the steps in between, right? Um, what are humans imperfect at? We're imperfect at well, we just have imperfect information. We have imperfect memories, first of all, right? Um, we're subject to biases, biases like if uh, something bad happened more recently, we're going to overestimate how dangerous that thing is, right? Um, you might have heard this. Uh, I don't know if it's apocryphal, but I think I believe there was a study, something to the effect of judges before lunch. Right, like are likely to sentence or like, like put somebody or something to that effect, like harsher sentences, you might call the hungriness bias. Right? And he was just start listing these things that cognitive scientists have been studying for the last 30 years. Various kinds of biases in the way that humans um, make decisions mean that we have an uneven application of the law, at, to put it mildly. Right? So some people say, like, okay, racism. Right? That's a feature of an uneven application that's going to be controlling certain neighborhoods and certain people uh, disproportionately than others. Right? Um, sentencing somebody you know, closer to lunch to a larger sentence, that's uh, an uneven application of the law. Uh, bail reform. The biggest push towards algorithms comes from the bail reform movement. Right now it takes 30 seconds in front of a judge for the judge to say, yeah, I guess bail. Bail 500, bail 1,000, no bail at all. Right? We already um, kind of know that the problem with the bail system is that if you can afford to get out, you get out. If you can't afford to get out, you don't get out. But there's also the fact that um, judges are making decisions about who should get out at all, who gets bail. And they're making predictions about how dangerous the particular individual is in 20 to 30 seconds by looking at a rap sheet. Right? Um, and so the idea is if we have data driven machine learning, that generates a certain outcome, and we defer to that outcome, you're going to solve some of these problems. Maybe you won't solve all of them, but at least it won't, you won't have uneven application across the bar or something with a hungriness bias or something like that. That's the push, anyways. Um, um, well, these arguments, together with good old fashioned military industrial capitalism, is pushing in the direction of increased outsourcing of human decision making to machine decision making. And so, let me talk a little bit about this whole military industrial capitalism part, which seemed to come out of nowhere. Well, um, there's this prominent pattern in recent history um, that a lot of you do know about, which is the wind down, the drawdown from the Iraq and Afghanistan wars had all this surplus military equipment. That local police departments were purchasing, and you might have heard about this, you know, like the, uh, the militarization of the police. Right? Like, look at like um, local police departments; they now have tanks and rocket launchers and things like that. Um, which, what's less talked about is the fact that military um, technology what, um, came back, came home from the wars, and are being sold and purchased by local police departments. Um, most notably, the technologies surrounding um, learning about 
locations of violence and trying to predict future sites of violence on the basis of past patterns of violence, right? Um, essentially, AI driven programs that were designed to detect um, IEDs or insurgencies now applied to crime data meant to be used in the prediction process for future crimes. And the, um, the prominent model that I'm going to talk about today with, with respect to policing is Predpol because they are the largest predictive policing software company, but it's not that they're the only ones. Um, there, there are others. Um, there was a big start in about I mean, six, seven years ago. Predpol kind of is dominant sort of the West Coast and being sold as a product to, to the UK at the moment. Essentially what the algorithms do, um, AI algorithms do, is it trains itself on predicting, right? By predicting the past and then using that to try to predict the future, right? So you predict past and past. You get the data from, I'm making this up, 1990 to 1995, see how well it predicts 1996, right? 1996 to 1998, see how As soon as you get a good enough model, you pilot that. You give it to a police department. Tripole was piloted in Santa Cruz, California. Um, so this is what Tripole gives you. This is the output uh, of a, of a Tripole um, algorithm daily. Right? Every day it takes um, data from the past, however long, and, uh, and data from up until last night. Um, and in the morning it generates a map, as you see up there. Uh, the map has red squares in it that represent a 500 by 500 foot by 500 foot block that's called a hotspot. When, when I gave this talk in Santa Cruz, they were like, yeah, I live right there. <laughs> <laughs> really said, they they didn't have no idea this was happening, but it's like, well, you should, right? Um, what's a hotspot? Um, well, it is what is predicted by the algorithm to be a likely place, location, for a property crime during that day. So things you have to think about here are um, what's sort of the resolution of the prediction. So, like, so their crime prediction has been going on for a long time, sort of what criminologists do, right? And you can probably do, you can probably think that, you know, crime follows recessions. Right, or something like that. And but what you're doing has a resolution that has a larger your know, time span is quite large, right? Probably within within a year or two years, you can right, predict trends like that. Um, what Predpol differs in is that it predicts crime within locations, right? So the resolution is sharper for location, but also sharper with respect to day. Um, and there are currently researchers working on with a resolution of three to six hours as well. Right. Um, those kinds of those that kind of research is focusing on movement patterns, right? That you get from right, GPS data or check-in data from cell phones. And if you look at certain movement patterns, you can probably it, it sounds like creepier. It sounds pretty creepy actually. Um, but but it's sort of things like this, like like if a crowd is starting to move towards a certain area, you might like predict that there's a higher likelihood of crime. So like, it's, it's more like that. Okay. So here you are, 500 by 500 foot block, um, where crime is a property crime is predicted to be likely to occur on that particular day. Um, but what it's saying is something to this effect, at least what the officers are getting is this map. It's saying that the probability of crime given that you're inside one of these boxes is greater than the probability of crime given that you're not inside one of these boxes. That's the minimum of what it's saying. Right? That's the minimum. Right? In weather forecasting, you want something better than that. You want the number, right? Which we're used to. We're used to saying something like, pretty sharp too, like this area has 60% further north instead of 80%. We're not there yet, but it doesn't mean that this thing isn't generating numbers. It's just not getting the numbers to the police officer yet. Right? But there are numbers, right? Because you need to have the numbers to generate what? Is an increased probability in that area. But you need to know what the background probability is to know that this is higher than the other one. Um, but the, the numbers are something like 8 to 10 percent. Right? It's something like that for predictive policing currently. Um, so 
And if you think about it, it's really hard to be more accurate than that. Like if you if you, can, if you, if you think there's a 90% chance that there's going to be a property family already, you, you, you have to know quite a lot. Like right? you have to know, you know, like it, human intelligence isn't even that great, right? Like you have to actually know there's a drug deal that's about to go down, that you've heard something from it. But then it's like, is that 90%? Right? That's pretty high. But um, what is it used for? Well, that's an important part of the story. Right, the 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 official the the red, the red Bull is interesting as a company. I suggest you look it up and read that blog. Um, they they say we recommend it only for use of certain purposes, right? So they recommend it to be used for just increased control, right? So the kind of thing that might be like just drive there more often, you know, put people on foot there more often, park a squad car out there, something like that. Um, What's more concerning, at least concerning to some of the activists I talked to who pay for it, poll, is something like this. Um, is, it, can, is it or can it be used as some kind of evidence, right, that something suspicious is going on? Right? And what I mean by that is something like this. You've already got a map that tells you that the probability of crime occurring in this location is higher than outside of this location. Now you show up to that location and you see somebody hanging out, right? Do, does that justify you in thinking that there's a higher likelihood that that person is committed, that that person is involved in committing something, property crime, that's going on, right? And this is a, clearly not an academic question, right? Because we know that um, there, the police have to have certain grounds for stopping and frisking and for arrests. And I'll talk a little bit about what those grounds are. Um, but the, the term now for stop the first is a reasonable suspicion. Right? Um, does a pole map with a little box in it give an officer reasonable suspicion with respect to anybody who's inside that box? Right? That's a civil liberties question that hasn't been answered. Um, the courts haven't answered it. Nobody's. Um, Fredpole has said, don't treat it that way. We don't think so. Right? Um, but we also know that there's a precursor to this kind of style of reasoning called um, high, crime, high crime area, right? Um, the, the, the Supreme Court has ruled that being in a high crime neighborhood alone isn't enough to give you a reasonable suspicion of prosecution. But a high crime neighborhood plus anything else does, right? So a high crime neighborhood and walking away from an officer. Right, is enough to give you reasonable suspicion. Right? It hasn't been that. So, so th these are the kinds of um, um, moral questions, I think, that come from what's generated from the output of things like Red Bull. So let me talk a little bit more about how else these um, algorithms are used in the system, and then we'll talk about the philosophical questions. So policing is one area um, uh, where um, AI is being used, uh, predictive policing is called. So Red Pole, um, CompStat is like some a precursor, some of you know about CompStat is a famous uh, uh, system used in New York City. Uh, that's a, these are location-based, right? So you just get a map, you know, data about a map, and it's supposed to be scrubbed of all information in the regions, right? More controversially, in Los Angeles for about seven, eight years, um, there was a predictive policing program called Operation Laser, which was person-based. So the, what they generated every day wasn't a map, but a list of names. And that was a list of names essentially working the same way, right? Where um, given you know, crime histories and whatever was input from the last week, it gives you a, a list of names of people who are likeliest to commit crime that particular day. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to do whatever it is you're supposed to do in a prep bowl case, right? Maybe you like stick, stick that person out. Maybe you, Maybe you uh, park a squad car outside of the place. I don't know what, like, right? Yeah. As a matter of fact, what, what, it, what, what it was done was increase police contact with those individuals. Um, what the police call, um, God, what it was term, like, uh, consensual stops. Right? So you're always allowed to walk up to somebody and talk to them and, like, like can I switch you or something like that, right? Like, they're allowed to ask. You can say no, right? But think about it, right? I mean, like you're laughing about this for good reason. But right? think about it. If you're on this list, you're not on record, right? And the cops are like, have you on a list that says you're likely to commit a crime? 
Uh, and now you're being asked by an officer whether you can search or not. Well, same question arises, right? Is that enough for reasonable suspicion? Right? Um, so the mere existence of you on the list means that some algorithm has said that the probability of you're going to commit a crime is greater than the probability of you. Like other, anybody else around you. Um, okay, uh, then there's the things that are being used in uh, the court system, not in the leasing. And these are the things that are the biggest drivers of, of the use of algorithms. Uh, these are things that are, when people are um, arrested um, and booked, they run <coughs> an algorithm on an individual. Uh, the ROPSA, Compass, ETR, these are the names of these things. You can actually look some of them up. Some of them are open. You can actually see the questions that they ask people. Um, so these are things that um, are supposed to tell a judge or a social worker or a prosecutor um, the risk that you have of committing a future crime six months from the point at which you are filling out the form. Okay. So it predicts with a resolution, with resolution of six months. Um, those things are then also used in post-trial sentencing. Right? So uh, those things aren't allowed to be used in trials. So you can't actually use in a trial say, this person got a high risk score for you know, committing a crime. But after trial, um, and I, what I mean by after trial, sometimes it's not even a trial. <laughs> um, prior to sentencing, when you've already been um, um, when you've already been convicted of something, you are that is also admissible again. So a judge can look at that and determine a sentence based on what that thing says. And there was a famous case in Wisconsin, Lewis versus Wisconsin, in which the person challenged the, uh, the, the ability of the judge to use that as a um, as a component of sentencing and lost. So Wisconsin has um, set the precedent that you can use these things. The Supreme Court turned down the case. Right? Um, so, uh, and they're also used in parole decisions. Right? So once you're already in, so they're, they're they're everywhere in the criminal justice system. They're mostly used in the courts, but I showed you a little bit of how they're used in, the, in policing. Okay, so how so let's talk about these um, pretrial detention algorithms, the RLPS, and things that are supposed to predict recidivism within the next six months. Um, what do they ask? Uh, they ask things like that you would expect it to ask. They ask things that you would probably ask if you were tasked to predict of any given individual, um, whether they're recidivating in the next six, six months. Um, criminal history, gender, age, family history, right? Maybe you know, they adopted or raised by family, presence of fathers, mothers, drug and alcohol problems, housing history, right? Including whether they have a history of homelessness. Um, the crime rates in your neighborhood, employment histories, right, things like that. And from that, the algorithm generates a score. That score uh, gets placed into low risk, medium risk, high risk, right? And then the courts do something with that, right? What's the push? The push is supposed to be something like, why do reformers like this thing? The push is supposed to be something like, if you come out as low risk, no bail, no nothing, you get to go free, right? Um, free trial. Right? We don't have the hungry judge who like, doesn't like the way you were dressed that day. Right? Um, the question is what happens to people at the high risk end also? Right? Does a high risk score mean you get what you get put away? I mean, free trial. Right? So the idea is that you're supposed to still presume to be innocent. Why are you allowed to be put away? Um, well, because you have some high risk score. <laughs> um, so how are these things, um, how are these things measured in terms of their accuracy? Uh, so I, I'm going to go through this very quickly. If some of you know the, the difference between false positives, false negatives, and so on, this is a very quick um, kind of um, uh, a, a quick cliff note on, on that kind of thing. So the triangles on this represent uh, people who are in fact going to be future offenders, right? So people who in fact within six months um, are rearrested for some other offense, and the circles represent people who are not, right? And ideally. You want the AI is going to try to learn from past data and predict past futures. Ideally, you want the AI to give all and only uh, high scores to people who are future offenders, right? That's what you want. You want 
low scores to build the future algorithms in high scores and all of it. Um, and that's ideal. Nothing's that good, right? So when it's not that good, you're going to get false positives and false negatives. The false positives will be uh, people who get high scores who are future not offenders, right? And people who are false negatives are people who are future offenders who get low scores. Right? And the way that you measure the accuracy of these things um, is something called an AUC, area under the curve, which is um, essentially this. This is the measure. Let me see if I can explain this correctly. Like explaining statistics correctly is like hard for statisticians sometimes. It is if you take an arbitrary future offender and an arbitrary future non offender, triangle and a circle, what percentage of the time will the algorithm give the high score to a future offender? Make sense? And the AUC measures that. So AUC 0.62 in this example said. 62% of the time, when you have a uh, actual future offender, the algorithm will give the higher score to that individual. That, that's what AUC measures. Does that make sense? Did I do that okay? Okay, so AUC 1 is perfect, right? 100% of the time, when you get a triangle, it gives the high score to the triangle, right? Um, and 100% of the time, when it's a circle, it gives the low score to the circle. Um, 0.62 is 62% of the time. Okay. So how accurate are is the best, the best algorithm, right? The best algorithm for pretrial detention is Compass, right? Compass is a privately owned uh, algorithm. It's, a, it's proprietary, so we don't know what's inside. Um, so it's 0 0.7. 0 0.7. Um, Point 0.7 is the most accurate. An undergraduate at Harvard decided, I wonder how accurate random people are on Amazon. <laughs> and so gave a paragraph description of arbitrary triangles and circles from you know, um, some crime data and sent it out to whatever the sample is. Right? Say it's a good sample of 2,000, 3,000 people. Um, and their AUC was 0.7. <laughs> so, so right now, the, um, the AI guns up blazing algorithm is as accurate as random people judging from a paragraph. Okay. Uh, is that good or is that bad? <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't quite know like, how to think about that. But I think that's an important um, question for you to think about, which we'll get to when we talk about why I talked about statistics in the beginning of this. Like, how accurate? Is it, does it have to be before we'll be like, okay, then it's okay, right? Is it 75% accurate, like 90%? Like, like, what statistics are we looking at that we think it's okay? Um, so one of the things that um, one of the um, a researcher named Sandra Mason did in 2018 was look at um, past pasts, <laughs> right? And looked at the high risk scores and looked at um, past futures within the next six, six, um, six months and trying to assess the actual probability that people were um, committing crimes again when they got high scores, right? Um, and this is what she found. She found the re-arrest rate among the highest risk bracket, the highest risk group of people who had the highest scores um, for three different instruments, um, PTRA, you, know, you can look up what those instruments are, where they're used, was between 8 and 16%. Eight, that means between 92 and 84 percent of people who got the highest score did not commit a crime within the next six months, which goes to show how difficult it is to predict this kind of thing. Right? Um, we don't know what it is for Compass because we don't have that information. Um, so there's a problem with this kind of use, this outsourcing, that it's not that accurate. Well, it's like, what do you compare it to? Right? How accurate are judges when they put somebody in? Right? Um, like if you had to do the, I mean, like, I don't even know how you would do that. Because like, if the judge thinks you're dangerous, you're going in. Right? You're not going like, like, to do a controlled experiment, judge. Like, you, if you're really strongly inclined to put this person in, 
let them go free, we'll see if they get rearrested in like six months, and then we'll like look at your like assessment rate, you know, like your, your you know, how do you do that? Well, um, how accurate is accurate enough for various purposes in the criminal justice system will depend on sort of thing I talked about at the very beginning, which is what kind of, what do we think we, we are allowed to do with statistical evidence when it comes to the criminal law? Right, so this was the very first, right? Sometimes 75% we don't think is good enough. Sometimes we think 75% is good enough. And we don't know why we think that in some cases and why that in other. This is sort of like a weird philosophical problem that nobody really has an answer to right now. Um, well, in the legal context, um, we would like answers to the question, when can an officer stop and frisk you? Reasonable suspicion. That's the word we put on it. When can an officer arrest you? Probable cause. Right? When can you be convicted of a step ahead to beyond a reasonable doubt? Right? When we have things that are making judgments, algorithms, that give you precise numbers, then we at least want a ballpark number here. Right? Because, like I said before, this whole thing with the box, right? does that give an officer reasonable suspicion? It's a question that we haven't had answered. But you know, there are these little like, cases that have come up in the law, the Supreme Court, um, where they have actively resisted putting a number on the case. So let me give you an example, right? So reasonable suspicion. Um, the shoplifter case, right? So imagine that there's a shoplifter, and an officer sees the shoplifter uh, run into a crowd of nine people. <coughs> and now we can't just distinguish all ten of them from each other. Does the officer have enough grounds for frisking all of them? Right? If, the, if your answer seems to be, yeah, I guess so, then 10% is high enough for reasonable suspicion. Now you go back to numbers like this, and we're already in that ballpark. Right? The probable cause, you know, that sounds like it's easy. Probable, 50%, 51%. But the courts have already said that 33% is like high enough, and maybe even lower. So on the podcast, I talk about this, this, this Maryland versus Pringle case, where there were three people in the car, and the, drug, and the officer found drugs, and it was one of theirs, and the other two didn't know anything about it. And he arrested all three. Right? So there's a one in three chance. And the person said, yeah, that's fine. This stuff can be all right. right? Um, and they wouldn't put a floor on it. You know, the, 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 the justices of the Supreme Court said, 33% is improbable, but it's enough to cause a guess. Right? And then, it's, and then but they, they asked the question, what about 10? Like if there was a van? Um, and they weren't willing to say, no, it's not. But of course, if it was a bus full of 100 people, then maybe they thought that was. But like, we don't know what the number is. And probable cause are the, is the grounds for arrest. Right? Um, and I would. Um, I would. What's the word I'm looking for? I would put forward that probable cause is enough for conviction. And the reason is most people don't go to trial. If you are arrested and it's possible for you to be put behind bars, you're going to want to cop a clean deal. And you're incentivized to do that because you want to get out of jail. Right? Now, all of these activists who tell and lawyers who are working on this say the primary driver of mass incarceration are not unfair trials or standards. It's that when you're arrested, when the standard is just probable cause, um, and you're locked up, you have a lot of incentive to plead guilty to something that's put in front of you. Right? And so if you do plead guilty, you're never put on trial, and you never have to face a beyond reasonable doubt conviction from the state. Right? Probable cause is like de facto the thing that a lot that that turns innocence into guilt in many cases. Okay, so something like people have <laughs> estimated things like reasonable suspicion is 10%, probable cause is 33%. We actually don't know what these numbers are supposed to be, right? Because we don't know what the relationship is supposed to be between statistics and like what people are allowed to do. And it goes all the way back to the problems that we had with you know the blue bus. 
right? If an algorithm says that you are 10% or 18% likely to recidivate, or that being in a box takes you a higher probability than everybody else who's outside of the box would be able to find, um, we don't have an answer to that question of whether or not that is grounds enough for the state to intervene with a threat of violence to put you away for some other purpose, right? We need an answer to that question. That, I think, is the crucial like, ethical, moral, philosophical question that the system itself isn't going to give you and that AI is not going to give you. Right? So a lot of people have been complaining about these AIs if you um, follow politics. But, uh, right? So politicians are talking about this. They say a lot of these algorithms are racist, a lot of these algorithms are inaccurate based on bad data, and that's all true. Right? This problem is a problem that faces even the best algorithms. Right? Because the best ones, even if they aren't racist, are ones which give you a number like, based on all past data, something like 18% of individuals, like this person, will go on and commit another crime in six months. Right? So, when you have that kind of information, what are you allowed to do and what are you not allowed to do? Right? Because, as a matter of fact, right now, we're, we're saying that you can't present that information in a trial. That biases jurors, right? To think that this person is predicted by an algorithm to be whatever, 60% likely to be, a, right, um, to, to be guilty of something is not a decision. But we are using that to determine whether somebody should be locked up after arrest. We are using it to determine whether or not they should be increasingly patrolled on the street, right? And we all know that the longer you look at something, the longer you're gonna find something. Right, for someone, and even like, you know, like if you consider yourself a law abiding citizen, right, would you want a cop following your car? Right, all that, you're, they're gonna find something, right? You're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna get a ticket eventually. Um, um, right, and as a matter of fact, greater than 90% of people are incarcerated, that are incarcerated and sentenced are done so outside of trials. And these things are admissible during sentencing, right? So, is it fair? Well, I actually think the key to this is to think about why is it's not admissible in the case of a trial. Right? I think the key to thinking about it, whether we should use it outside of the trial, depends on why do we think that 75% of the blue buses, of the buses are blue, is it enough to sue the blue bus company? That's like the wrong kind of evidence. So why do we think that some algorithm telling a juror or a judge during a trial that this person is a like the highest risk for committing a crime? Is that, is that a judicial information? Why do we think that? But we don't think that outside. Um, okay, another way to think about it is, um, I told you all a lot about how these algorithms work and what they're used for. But what if this was a different talk? And I told you there are all these al algorithms out there predicting high risk of committing crimes within the next six months. And what they're used for is to determine aid for communities. Right? Would you then go, oh, these algorithms are racist, they're so bad, right? They're like, oh, they might not. And I, and I tell you, they're not that accurate, by the way. There's like some error rate now that for like only. 10% of the time, people actually think, like, yeah, you know, that sucks, but I mean, if we're increasing aid, and then we're trying to find the best way, that's the best thing we have to figure out where to target. You know, this goes back to that, like, that first, you know, like that second puzzle that I gave you, which is like you're allocating a million dollars, and then 75% of it comes from Model A. And you're like, oh, just give it to them, and we'll lower the <laughs> Yeah, you're going to, you are allowing yourself more error when the goal is different. Right? But you're not allowing yourself all that much error because you think it's something fundamentally wrong when it's like in a trial setting. Um, okay, uh, let me skip this for a second. And I think what's going on here is we know, at least implicitly, not explicitly, that the aims of criminal justice are different in a trial system, in, a, in, a, in the context of a trial versus whatever it is that judges are supposed to be doing when they are incarcerating someone pre-trial, right? Um, 
What are trials supposed to determine things? They're supposed to determine culpability, right? Which is this term that we have that comes from moral <laughs> common sense, something like being morally responsible for something that happened, being at fault, right? And culpability goes with what we call the philosophy of retributive justice, right? The, the justice that's involved with retribution, the justice that's involved, involved in giving somebody their just desserts, the, uh, the justice that's supposed to be involved in punishing people who deserve to be punished, right? who deserve the blame, and so forth. It's backward. It looks back at what people have done and tries to allocate things in the world that are supposed to make it like square the, the, the injustices that have occurred. And then there's something called preventive justice, right? Which is always forward looking, it's future looking. Um, and these are subject to different kinds of moral terms. Um, preventive justice is thought of on the model of what we call the model defensive part, right? So um, self-defense, if you're trying to prevent certain things from happening. The moral principles involved in preventive harm are things like this. Um, what are you going to do to prevent a certain harm? Well, it should be the least harmful thing that you can do, right? So, or, or it should be proportional to the kind of thing you're preventing against. Um, you only do something harmful if it's needed. If it's not needed, then you do something less harmful from it, and so forth, right? So forward looking. And these are actually explicitly stated as aims. So in the Supreme Court case, Somera versus the US, um, this was a case that asked the Supreme Court, how can we ever put anyone in jail before a trial, free trial at all? Because like, they haven't been convicted. Um, and isn't there a presumption of innocence? Doesn't there a presumption of innocence mean people should go free until their trial? And you know, William Rehnquist in the majority decision said, well, there's preventive justice, and preventive justice authorizes incarceration. Well, here's, some, here's what I want you, you all to think about before I end for questions, which is, it seems like the key moment in which we're interested in retributive justice, the trial, we don't like algorithmic information, statistical information, about likelihood that they committed something, right? Um, in preventive justice, it seems okay, but that's only because we think that in preventive justice, you're prevented from harming people unnecessarily for the purpose of prevention, right? Um, so I've listed a bunch of moral principles that go with different systems of justice here, right? So retributive justice, I'm not going to read them because I'm running out of time. Um, but I think that what's going on, and I'm going to end this with um, uh, something that I'm sure you want to discuss, but I'm going really quickly at the end here, is whether statistical evidence is legitimate depends on what we're using for, right? It depends on the background moral constraints on the institutions that are relying on that evidence. When it's a trial, we kind of understand that a trial is there to figure out whether somebody is responsible and therefore deserving of punishment, and therefore we think statistical information is really legitimate. That's not the right kind because of those kinds of constraints, uh, states, right? Um, but when we think of preventive justice <laughs> We're, we're thinking about, well, yes, for the purposes of preventing future accidents, allocate a million dollars to like Model A. But we're not thinking about like volume Model A. We're not thinking of like really punitive things that are happening. We're not thinking of preventing as something punitive. We're not thinking of preventing as something of giving somebody what they deserve, right? But if that's true, it turns out that. Um, the criminal justice system can't have it both ways because what it does pre-trial is exactly as punitive as what it does in trial, right? The only tools that criminal justice has is violence or the threat of violence, right? For police, it's guns and arrest. For the courts, it's jail, which is precisely the kind of things we use for punitive justice in the court in the trial system, right? So we seem to be okay with preventive justice and using statistical evidence in the air for that, but only on the assumption that the kind of things that we're doing are not punitive. But we're putting, but because we've located both preventive and retributive justice in the same system, those are the only tools we're using. Okay, so so I think that criminal justice can't have it both ways. We have to either have to give up on one of these aims or split the institution into two. 
right? And you could and, and prevent the cross contamination, as I would like to put it, of um, retributive and preventive justice. But you can't use the tools of retributive justice for preventive purposes. And uh, you can't use the epistemology of preventive justice in the punitive system. Okay, thank you. Thanks, that was super interesting. Uh, I have a brief slide of a question. I think the study you're referring to about the decisions uh, for an upper line of the box. Yeah, that's why, yeah. From memory, it's an Israeli study about role decisions, but it relies on thinking that all of the decisions are of equal merit. But my understanding was because the the first decisions were of unequal merit, and ordering decisions based on like putting the hardest ones right before the break. And that's why the ones that Kind of don't mind. But it looks to me like a really good decision, or well, good judgment in a lot of ways. So I'm asking why I don't like it. See, it's also the case. Uh, getting the details a little bit wrong, but guy who commits a ton of armed robberies, he gets uh, convicted, gets incarcerated, gets released, he gets another, gets convicted, gets incarcerated, gets released. The last one actually, he commits an armed robbery, I think within three hours of being released from prison. And then he gets hit with, from memory, a three strikes um, violation. So that's like a 40 year um, uh, mandatory uh, prison term upon conviction. And Posner says in sentencing, let's just know this is a really, really, really stupid decision. Because statistically, armed robbery is a young man's game. Like it's almost all committed by men between the age of 18 and 35. Yeah. Even men between the age of 18 and 35 who commit armed robberies repeatedly usually don't commit armed robberies in their 50s or 60s. Yeah. So like outside of certain like very aged Hollywood leading men who probably shouldn't have yeah. happened before, that doesn't really happen very often. And the likelihood that this person would go on to commit these kinds of crime sprees if we had a 10 year sentence upon their release, extremely low. So what's the point of the extra 30 years? That's in my mind looks like really good reasoning. Yeah. But it seems to be ruled out if we're going to try and prevent the cross contamination of your why why would it be why would it be ruled? So 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 ruling out means that there's a stage where you determine what, if you like retributive justice, which I actually don't, but if you do, if you think that that's ought to be the system, then you have a sentencing phase with respect to retributive evidence, right? So then you follow the principles of retributive justice, say something like Two people who commit the same crime deserve the same sentence. Like that's not a preventive like, uh, principle, that's like the truth. Um, <laughs> and then um, something else justifies further preventive. So I, I like the preventive reasoning in, um, in, in Posner's um, line of reasoning. But I, all, I, all I mean is that it's got to be separated out of, of the retributive. Like, I think there needs to be two different decisions and two different standards of evidence for both of them. That makes sense, right? So, so if you were like a preventive person and you thought um, something like, okay, you have to look at the statistical evidence um, to see what the proper prevention measures are, then you're going to see that, okay, um, at most it justifies up to like age 35 um, intervention by the state. That's not ruled out. That's just a, a, a decision that's made by a preventive justice judge that allow, that when you're when you're allowed to help yourself to the kind of data that preventive justice that preventive justice calls for. What what it what it doesn't do. So you, you can't, for instance, I, I don't think that you can use that kind of data to determine whether he deserves right right that makes sense. So I don't. So I, I like the reasoning. I don't like the reasoning if it's data used for purposes of determining how much he deserves. 
if, if you like dessert as a as a name. If that makes sense, right? So um, that kind of evidence is not allowed in the dessert case, right? Um, so you so don't what that person deserved is one that makes sense. We probably have time for one more question. Oh, we have. Some more. Um, so I have a lot of trouble with purity, and I guess I want to push back a little bit on these two categories that you've set up. Um, as being so distinct, retributive and preventative, and then talking about the cross contamination between them. I'm just, I'm thinking, I mean, the history that we got of Eastern State before you started, I mean, there was a vision that this was going to be preventative, and the people who committed crimes were pulled out of the community, and they were going to sit alone and become penitent. I mean, it was forward looking vision. And it ended up being terribly retributive. Solitary confinement drove people crazy, you know, this terrible, terrible system. Um, conversely, the system we have now doesn't even care about rehabilitation, basically. It's totally retributive. But there are lots of guys you know, um, imprisoned who see the light while they're there. That is, they're furious, they've been mistreated by the uh, criminal justice system, and yet, um, they come to some sense of accountability, responsibility. This whole thing about people aging out of crime is legendary. I mean, guys who commit crimes at 16 or 21, and they're different people by the time they're 65. So I think it was a great talk. I think it's really neat. I, I really don't think I buy the, these two categories that you set up as being sure that we've got to keep separate. We've got to split into two systems. I just think they, they've always worked. They're tangled in a way that I, I don't think your analysis is acknowledging. I think that what I am, I'm not saying that there are, uh, I accept everything that you said about the way that um, people who have been punished um, can then competitive and then no longer um, commit crimes. And also, um, in the interest of preventing, we become very punitive. These are correct descriptions of the system that we have. Um, I think what I was trying to argue was that insofar as you think the law should aim for retribution and also aim for prevention, um, we shouldn't think the same practices used in each and the same standards for evidence used in each are all right, they're in harmony with each other. Right? That's sort of what I think of, uh, like, um, so that's all I was arguing about saying, to, uh, saying that the practices and the standards of evidence for when you are allowed to punish somebody should not be thought of as the same set of things that you are allowed to use when you are in prison. That's, that's, sort of, that's, that's the extent of which um, I was calling for some permission. I, I, I want to be mindful of your okay. time. Already on five minutes over. But uh, there is a reception just sort of one little um, ways down the next block. And if there are blue questions, I'm So I want to thank.